First of all, thank you very much also to Thomas and Elio for the kind invitation to, to come here to Stuttgart Max Planck Institute. Actually, it's a place with many fond memories of mine because I've spent six years of my life here and it's great to see some familiar old faces in the audience. So I'm going to talk today about nickelate superconductivity with a special focus on some, on some recent developments. Before I start, I'd like to thank my co-workers and let me in particular pick out here these three young guys, Liangsi, Mutuharu, Kitatani and Paul Worm, who did uh, most of the work, who did all of the actual calculations that I will present today. All right, let's start in, in media's race. Three years ago, we entered a new age of high temperature superconductivity, the nickel age. And as you see here, more recently, it also started to, to have a somewhat larger TCs. So uh, the record TC is now at 30 Kelvin. Um, and, and this discovery led to an enormous experimental and uh, theoretical effort. And, and the hope here is maybe not to surpass the TC of the cuprates, but rather to gain a better understanding of superconductivity. Because in contrast to the iron plictides, the nickelates are at the same time very similar to the cuprates, but also decisively different. And therefore we have high hopes that they will allow us to discriminate the essentials from the incidentals in in these cuprate nickelate high temperature superconductors and thus eventually to better understand high temperature superconductivity. The outline of my talk is as follows. I will um, start uh, discussing the similarities and differences to the cuprates and then I will advocate for a very simple minimal model to describe the nickelates. It just consists of uh, two ingredients, so the nickel x squared minus y squared orbital, which we can describe as a Hubbard model. And additionally, there are some pockets which uh, dope the systems, even for the parent compounds, so, so we cannot completely neglect them. But uh, what, what we find is that these pockets can act only, or act only as a largely coupled reservoir for, for holes that you dope into the system. So that is, so to speak, the very minimal model to describe nickelates and let's see how far we come. And, and one of the first things we have done um, two years ago is we have calculated superconductivity at a time where actually no experimental phase diagram was yet available. Um, and uh, then experiments came up and the agreement was first uh, quite well, considering how difficult it is to calculate TC. But, but a year ago at, at this online conference by Thomas, I was asked, well, okay, there's just some disagreement with experiment. So what can you do in your theory better? But eventually it turned out that, that experiments could do better. So, so making cleaner films, the TC increased quite substantially. And, and now um, the agreement with our theoretical prediction is, is just overwhelming. So much more than you could have dreamed of in your wildest dreams. So, um, it seems to work quite reasonably. Um, another recent development besides these clean films is that um, there have been finite layer nickelates by the group of Julia Mundi in uh, Harvard. And um, they are different from, from these previous infinite layer nickelates, which we have here. There are no pockets. And, and uh, I will discuss that. And, and they further restrict the possible theories to describe nickelates. But if you have a theoretical description, of course, the question is how to increase TC. And, and uh, what was quite clear from, from the very beginning in our calculation is that pressure or strain will increase TC. And that is indeed what, what happened. So this record TC here of 30 Kelvin is under 12 gigapascal of pressure. Um, so with pressure, you can increase TC spectacularly confirming uh, what, what also comes out of the calculation. Last but not least, I, I would like to, to, to show you some preliminary calculation where we, we uh, look at color dates because we think besides pressure also going from 3D nickelates to 4D color dates might increase TC somewhat. So that is the outline of my talk, but let's go uh, back to the similarities and differences and the similarities have been 
uh, recognized a long time ago. So, so actually Vladimir Anisimov and uh, co-workers uh, did DFT plus U calculations and based on these DFT plus U calculations more than 20 years ago, they said, okay, these nickelates are just like the cuprates, so they should be superconducting. Um, then at some point, heterostructures came up and it actually Ginyard uh, here from the Max Planck uh, pointed out that one can use these heterostructures to further uh, make these systems more similar. And together with Philip Hansmann and Ole Andersen, we then also did some calculations for these nickelate heterostructures. But it took 20 years uh, until three years ago, experiment was finally able to synthesize these nickelate. So it's extremely difficult to synthesize nickelate in this high one plus oxidation state. There's therefore all kinds of dirt. It took so long to synthesize them. Um, it also took one year uh, before these experiments by the group of Harold Wang could be reproduced by Ariando Ariando from Singapore. And, and now we have quite a number of nickelates, including the five layer compounds that are superconducting. We have higher quality films. And, and we, we have applied pressure, and, and these are some recent developments. But still, it's only a handful of groups uh, throughout the world that is uh, able to synthesize superconducting nickelates. Um, uh, as far as I know, at least up to, up to very recently, no group in Europe yet, but I know here at the Max Planck Institute, Matthias Hepting and uh, uh, Bernhard Keimer are, are putting much efforts also to, maybe, maybe they succeeded yesterday, and I don't know about it, uh, but it's very difficult, yeah, that you should have in mind. Now, if you have this nickelate, the um, crystal structure is identical to the arguably simple cuprate, but certainly not the best superconductor, calcium copper O2. So you have these nickel oxygen two planes. They are spaced by a neodymium uh, layer to the next uh, nickel oxygen two layer. And the formal oxidation in both cases is also a 3D9 configuration for cuprate and nickel. Now, if you look into more detail, um, differences start to show up. And if you know nothing about the system besides the crystal structure and, and that it is a superconductor, the very first step to do should be to do a DFT calculation to get at least a, a rough overview of what kind of, of orbitals are relevant. And uh, many people have done such calculation, including some here in the audience. And I show here calcium copper oxide and lanthanum nickel oxide. In uh, the DFT calculation, you have this x squared minus y squared orbital crossing the Fermi surface. It forms this hole like pocket within the uh, red Brion zone. You have these four Fermi surface sheets. Um, but that is DFT. Then electronic correlations come into the game. And they will split um, this uh, D band into two Hubbard bands. And uh, because oxygen states are very close to the Fermi energy, the general agreement is that um, the consensus in the literature that these cuprates are charge transfer insulators, meaning that the first states available are here in the oxygen state and not in the copper Hubbard band. OK, that is cuprates. Now let's go to, to nickelates. Um, well, first of all, the oxygen states are much lower in energy. So, so we really don't expect that holes go to the oxygen. That is a first difference. But, but then things look much more complicated at first glance. So you have here two bands crossing the Fermi energy at the gamma and A points. They are derived from the neodymium bands. And they form additionally to the x squared minus y squared whole pockets, they form some electron pockets around the gamma and around the A point. So they do self dope uh, the, the system, and, and therefore the Hall coefficient in the cuprates is positive, whole like, whereas in the nickelates, at least at small doping, it's uh, negative, electron like because of such whole pockets. But again, you have to ask what electronic correlations are doing. And what you also see here is that there is a orange here, a z squared orbital. It's closer to the Fermi energy than the cuprates. And, and we, we have to see uh, how this picture changes with electronic correlations. So the workhorse uh, uh, to, to um, look into electronic correlation for such a material is dynamical uh, mean field theory or DFT plus DMFT. And, and we, but also other groups, 
have, have done that, including all five um, nickel d orbitals, all five neodymium or lanthanum d orbitals in the calculation. And uh, here is the, the uh, band structure, what you see in, in DMFT. White is the DFT from the last slide. And what you see here is that you have a quasi-particle renormalization by about a factor of uh, five. Then you have some finite lifetimes here because these are calculations at room temperatures. So you have electron, electron scattering. Um, and, and that is for lanthanum nickelate. Um, if you look into further details, you see here the A pocket, which you also have seen in DFT. But the gamma pocket, which is present in the undoped neodymium nickelate, shifts above the Fermi energy for the lanthanum compound. It also shifts up in energy if you dope the system into the superconducting regime. So the, the basic description that we have here is, okay, we have a D X squared minus Y squared orbital for the nickel, and we have an A pocket. But the gamma uh, pocket is already widely varying, so, so it might take up some holes, but uh, that indicates that, that it would be very complicated for it to play a major part in the superconductivity of the system because it's so sensitive on the doping and on the rare earth compound uh, you have. So um, if you have such a kind of calculation with all the orbital, let's uh, um, take uh, Occam's razor and simplify the model as far as possible. And as far as possible is really just to have the two orbitals, x squared minus y squared and the a pocket there's a z squared orbital here, but it's still below the Fermi energy. Uh, it shifts up, but in the superconducting regime, in, in this calculation, it doesn't contribute to the Fermi surface yet. Okay, that is the simplest model, and let's see how far we come. Um, there is a, a well uh, written and, and uh, uh, worth reading article by Igor Maasen in, in Nature Physics, who argued that, that uh, we, we have. Um, uh, um, uh, developed the bad habit to have an inverse Occam's razor. So, so that whenever we have two theories, a simple and a complicated one, we favor the complicated one because it gives us a higher chance to publish in a high impact journal. So um, let's not do it here. Let's try, like I like learned in our physics 101 course, to, to do the most simple model and, and uh, see how far we come. And that is this model. It, gets even a little bit uh, better because we have now the pocket that is this niodium, mainly xy orbital, and we have the nickel x squared minus y squared, but the two don't hybridize. So, so a further simplification, at least as a first approximation possible, is that, that you consider these as decoupled orbitals because the pocket and the Hubbard model, the nickel x squared minus y squared orbital are not hybridized. And therefore, we end up just with a Hubbard model for the nickel x squared minus y squared orbital. But uh, this pocket, or these pockets, a pocket in particular, still act as a reservoir. So if you strontium dope the system, some of the holes will go to the nickel uh, x squared minus y squared orbitals, and some will go here to the reservoir. But at least in the first approximation, the two don't speak with each other. So uh, with this simple description, um, we end up uh, with, with a simple Hubbard model description, and it's actually the first time I use a Hubbard model to describe a real material, but I think for nickelates it's justified. Um, but you have to properly calculate uh, the doping of your system. Um, uh, so, so that is what we have done here. That's the fully fledged 5 plus 5 orbital calculation. That's the strontium doping you do in experiment. And it translates here to the blue curve. That's the occupation of your x squared minus y squared orbital. And you see about half of the holes go into the uh, Hubbard model in the x squared minus y squared orbital and half go to the reservoir or the pocket. Then for this one band Hubbard model, we can use CRPA to calculate the U. We can make one function projection to calculate the hopping parameters. We have to translate the doping. And then let's see how far we can come. Um, you also see here that at some point this curve lets off because here then the z squared orbital becomes active. Okay, um, there have been all kinds of 
other suggestions are because you have a complicated new system, you have f orbitals in the niodium compound. So the first suggestion was that these f orbitals might be important in, in different ways, but, but uh, it's difficult to believe because you have both superconducting nickelates with and without f orbitals with f uh, because you have the lanthanum compound as well. So that would be a very complicated theory making the f orbital a major ingredient. Um, for the z squared orbital, the discussion is, is still ongoing. There are some um, uh, uh, calculations by Frank Lechermann using a new thick DMFT. And in, in, in this variant, new variant of DMFT finds a z squared Fermi surface. You don't get it in the other DMFT or GW plus DMFT calculations. They are very similar to what I've shown you. Um, also in our calculations, the z squared orbital becomes relevant. It pushed up with doping, but it only becomes relevant if you are beyond the superconducting doping regime. Then of course, there is, if you have a gamma pocket, there is some hybridization with the z squared. So, so you have some z squared holes because of the hybridization and that has been very much emphasized in, in this works. But with the gamma pocket being so sensitive, I also don't think it's so relevant. So, Last but not least, more recent experimental evidence. It's not a full proof, but uh, it's evidence points by the interpretation of Rick's data that the z squared orbital doesn't play such an important role. Okay. Um, there are also more uh, other orbitals, more exotic uh, things that, that have been discussed for the Michelates. Um, but, but let's just stick with the simple description just the uh, x squared minus y squared Hubbard model and the reservoir, and let's see how far we can come. Um, uh, Georg Rohringer and Alessandro Toski already introduced to use a dynamical gamma sense for the vertex approximation. Um, and, and we use it here first to calculate spin fluctuations that is done here. You can imagine this d gamma a as a generalization of dynamical mean field theory which takes a local self energy and then calculates a non local green function. Here we, we take this locality concept to the next level. We have a local irreducible vertex gamma. And from that, we calculate spin fluctuations. And eventually, also from these spin fluctuations, we put it in the particle particle in the Cooper channel to calculate superconducting uh, uh, fluctuations. So it's a one step process so far. So we do the uh, ladder variant here and uh, get the antiferromagnetic spin fluctuations. Thomas, our organizer, has uh, a very nice paper with comparing multi methods, and, and he has shown that these antiferromagnetic fluctuations come out uh, very well in um, uh, D gamma A. It's an excellent agreement, it's more numerical diagrammatic Monte Carlo calculations, for, among others. So, so that seems to work. And the reason why it works, um, it's similar to the RPA, but it already includes some frequency dependence and screening. So you have particle particle screening included in this local gamma. It's suppressed at low frequencies. And, and therefore, while RPA gives you way too large spin fluctuations, the spin fluctuations which you get here, as Thomas showed, are uh, in, in very good agreement with numerical results. Okay. Um, that is uh, what we do. Um, first step is to calculate the self energy and to look at the spectrum. And then for the undoped parent compound, because of the pockets, it has some 5% uh, hole doping and it has a pseudo gap here in the spectrum. So I only show you now the x squared minus y squared orbital. Here, there are additional pockets. Uh, if you go into the superconducting regime, on the other hand, you have well defined Fermi surfaces. Um, and, and now uh, what we do is we, we take this antiferromagnetic spin fluctuation, which give rise to the uh, um, um, uh, to the spectral functions, and, and do a, if you want to one step parquet, we plug them in once in the superconducting channel and calculate the superconducting TC as a function of strontium doping, whereas we have where, where we have to calculate, as I explained at the beginning, carefully to translate the strontium doping to the actual doping of our correlated x squared minus y squared orbital. At the time of our calculation, there was a single experimental data point available. 
says this one. And okay, theory was overestimating the experiment. Uh, there were no free parameters. Of course, we could have increased u that would put TC down, um, but, but it would have been unrealistically large. So, so of course, there are some errors in, in the constrained RPA calculations that we do, but, but it would be out of bounds. So, so that, that was not reasonable. So we sticked with, with this kind of disagreement with, with this experimental point, and we had a somewhat larger TC. In, in these regions, the gamma pocket become important, and here also the z-squared orbital becomes important. Now, the first experiment coming out of the group of Harold Wang showed this superconducting uh, dome. So um, qualitative agreement was very good. A quantitative, there were some differences, but if you consider how difficult it is to calculate TC, it was very reasonable. Yeah. Still, a year ago at Thomas conference, people were arguing, oh, well, but, but we have 15 Kelvin higher TC. Yeah, it's not 100 Kelvin higher. It's not minus 100 Kelvin lower. So, so why is it? What are you still missing in your theory? But it, it turned out that more clean films, and, and these are now the, the most recent results, are now in, in excellent agreement with the calculation. And in the calculation, we are making all kinds of, of errors. Yeah, you, you always should be aware of, of errors you make. You, you have um, uh, errors determine the doping. You have DFT and, and DMFT put your errors. Also, the way that we don't go back from our antiferromagnetic fluctuation, we go to the superconducting fluctuation, but not back uh, gives an error. So given this, this is more a better agreement than, than we would have dreamed of. And um, here uh, is, is uh, showing you these new films. Uh, these were the old films. And, and nickel one plus is so difficult to, to synthesize and, and you have all kinds of dirt in your films. Um, you have even more dirt in, in many other groups films because they are not even superconducting. But here you have these stacking faults um, uh, and, and, and you can imagine if you have so much dirt, uh, you're happy to be superconducting at the end of the day. And these are the new films um, and, and there is no such dirt. It's not only giving you a much higher TC, uh, but these new films also give you a much lower resistivity by a factor of three. Um, so so uh, that really shows you that uh, the, the disorder, the amount of disorder in these early films at least was still very substantial. To, to grow these more clean films, um, they used the LSAT instead of the STO substrate, but the change of lattice parameter compared to the disorder change is very minor. So the, the main effect, the main difference between these two is the amount of, of disorder that you had in the original films. Okay, that was superconductivity. Let's also compare the, the spin fluctuations with experiment. And uh, there have been Rick's experiment by, by Lou et al. That is the experiment here. And, and we can compare our D gamma A theory. Please remind yourself, these are still the old, uh, more dirty films. Yeah? And, and if you compare the maxima here, top on top, you see the agreement is, is reasonable, but experiment has a little bit less paramagnon dispersion. So that indicates that the antiferromagnetic coupling J is somewhat smaller. And indeed, that is maybe also something you might expect from more dirty films. Um, so he has some very nice experiments from the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart, the group of Matthias Hepting. So, so, so they see in, in some films where they don't even become superconducting that they have some spin glass behavior. So, so if you have more disorder in the system, there's indication that you have not only this antiferromagnetic exchange, which you have in the more clean and superconducting films to be dominating, but that you go more towards other couplings too. And, and that could be one explanation for the difference. So we are very much looking forward to see now Rick's experiment for the new cleaner films. And we would expect that then they are somewhere in between the old experiment and our theoretical calculation. Okay, um, uh, let me speed up a little bit and, and come to another recent development. And these are finite layer nickelates. Uh, and that is work by Julia Mundi. And, and they were able to synthesize 
a nickelate film with one, two, three, four, five nickelate layers. In the films I've shown you before, these uh, uh, layers would have been uh, continued up at infinitum, uh, but, but here you have a, a spacing layer without nickel and a larger distance to the next uh, nickel layer. And because of that here, you cut off the hopping to, to the next layer, the hopping in Z direction is already very, very small, but, but here it's definitely zero for all practical purposes. Now, that is the five layer compound. And um, we, we have then done the same DFT, DMFT calculation. Um, from the cuprates, you know that these finite layer cuprates have much higher TCs, they are very different. So, so that is what we expected here too. But, but if you look at them and uh, get the hopping parameters at the end of the day for the nickel x squared minus y squared orbital, for the two layer film, they are still different. But for the five layer film, the hopping parameters are virtually indistinguishable. And, and the reason why we think these finite layer nickelates are much closer to the infinite layer nickelates is that you grow, synthesize these films on the strontium titanate substrate. And because of that, you have, don't have bulk as in the cuprates, and you have much less freedom to, to change your lattice parameters with the finite layer films. And, and the substrate uh, therefore uh, locks in the in-plane lattice constant, and then the out-of-plane lattice constants are also not so flexible, and that gives you very similar hopping parameters. Um, now, again, uh, we can do um, uh, DFT calculation, DMFT calculations. These also have done by the group of uh, Botana. And, and that is the DFT. Now we have a two-dimensional Fermi surface, um, but we have five in equivalent layers. So, so in the Z direction, because of this cutoff hopping, there is virtually no uh, dispersion anymore. And in the DFT, you, you get again, as for the finite layer nickelate, a, a very tiny gamma pocket, but it's so close to the Fermi level that the, on, on very fine details, it can shift above or below the Fermi surface. Then you have these five layers of uh, uh, nickel x squared minus y squared orbitals. And instead of the A pocket, which we had before, we now have these tubes um, uh, around here and that is a DFT picture. Now, the, the main difference, if, or a, a very important difference, if you go from DFT to DMFT is that you get rid of the pockets, not only of the gamma pocket, as I've shown you for the infinite layer compound, but also of these tubes. So there are no pockets anymore. Um, and that is very important for, for superconductivity indeed, um, because we can, uh, the, the hopping parameters are, are essentially the same. So our D gamma A phase diagram here in, in red, TC versus a uh, whole doping of the X squared minus Y squared orbital is almost the same. Uh, um, but if you have the pockets as you do have in DFT, your doping is here above 25% holes in the system. And that is in the largely overdoped regime. So, so with these pockets, these finite layer nickelates wouldn't be superconducting. Um, or you would, would have to invent a new mechanism, but at, at least in a, a simple minded uh, theory like a Hubbard model, it is way too highly overdoped. Now, with the DMFT correlations, we get rid of the pockets and therefore we shift the doping around 20% doping. You have five layers, three inequivalent layers. So you have a little bit different doping for the three inequivalent layers. Uh, and then you are within the region where you would expect superconductivity. And if you translate uh, now, now the doping of the finite layer compound 20%, and if you put in here the previous uh, uh, experiment for the uh, infinite layer nickelate with strontium doping, it's here, and you see the two within experiment agree extremely well if you adjust for the proper doping with or without pockets and also with our dynamical vertex approximate, uh, approximation calculation. So besides the DC, which is speaking that the pockets are really not there, there's another experimental evidence that you don't have pockets, namely these 
finite layer annihilates have a positive hole coefficient. So meaning that you have the whole Fermi surfaces of the um, um, uh, nickel x squared minus y squared orbital, but no pockets which change the hole coefficient into negative for the uh, infinite layer nickelates. Okay. Um, and the last five minutes or so, if I may, I don't know uh, how the timing. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's see uh, how to increase TC. And what is shown here is a kind of phase diagram, Coulomb interaction versus filling. And what you see here as a fingerprint is the superconducting eigenvalue lambda. And everything above yellow, so yellow to red, would be superconducting in this uh, phase diagram. And, and very similar fingerprints have also been uh, uh, um, uh, found in DCA calculations by Emmanuel Gull. And the nickelates, so there's T prime zero, um, uh, no nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor hopping, and that is the T prime for the nickelates, and the nickelates are here. So it's not yet optimal for superconductivity, the U is too high. So we, the soft spot for superconductivity means you have to decrease U and to go to, to uh, somewhat closer to half filling, and, and then it's the optimal point for superconductivity. Um, uh, and the reason for that is actually these purple things, which are very dominating for the eye here in the diagram. And the purple is a false color uh, plot of your antiferromagnetic susceptibility. So in, in these regions, the antiferromagnetic susceptibility just becomes very large. And uh, if the, it becomes very large, we have, so to speak, the, the opposite story of, of what Andre told us Monday morning. So if the antiferromagnetic fluctuations are, are large, um, we are far away from a quantum critical point here yet, um, then the pseudo gap wins. It's also a non-Fermi liquid phase, but, but of course a different one than that close to um, the quantum critical point. And uh, that, that has been well known also before that with the strong antiferromagnetic fluctuations, you get a pseudo gap and this large scattering at the pseudo gap in these regions at this finite temperature suppresses uh, superconductivity. That is what we find here. And I think it is a very nice, uh, this deformation of the fingerprints shows how antiferromagnetic fluctuations suppress superconductivity and uh, uh, that the T prime equals zero is particularly bad. Okay, so what are the, um, ways to increase TC then, so we need a smaller U. There's some ways to do it, pressure or strain. You can use another substrate or you can use uh, another material because 4D systems have a larger T than 3D systems or smaller U over T. And therefore we think that palladates are maybe a little bit better suited than nickelates for superconductivity. Pressure was experimentally confirmed with this uh, record TC of 30 Kelvin. As I mentioned, let's look into palladates. Um, so um, here is the phase diagram for the palladates uh, and also nickelates TC versus doping. And you see that is a nickelate and with a, a, a palladate, you can get a little bit larger TC and a little bit closer to half filling because you um, uh, get a smaller Coulomb interaction. Okay, that's all what I wanted to say. So we have used Occam's razor to simplify the model as far as possible for nickelate superconductivity. We ended up with a one orbital problem, which can be described by Hubbard model plus a reservoir. And as I've shown you in this finite layer nickelate, you don't even need the reservoir. It's even simpler than that. And, and that gives you all together a consistent paper, a picture with all the experimental facts and with the phase diagram, then the TC of the finite layer nickelate is in agreement with the infinite layer nickelate and also with the TC calculated for this simple model. Thank you very much for your attention.